All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, today is March 25th, Thursday. Yeah, I just posted a, a new slide on the course website. Now I'm recording lecture videos. Um, I'm sorry for late unloading, but the, uh, you know, this is my first time teaching of a micro sequence, or my, the second sequence of microeconomics. And the uh, first part in microeconomics 2 addresses general equilibrium theory, but the, uh, this topic is what I studied a long time ago. So it takes me a lot of time, you know, uh, you know, recurring my memory uh, and the, uh, especially the uh, textbook of Musgrave, Winston Green is a, a too intricate. So I have to sort out, you know, some practical things like, a, uh, oh, this is what we have to know. And this is what we don't have to know, right? And so I have to compromise with yourself too, because this is a uh, online teaching, so cannot see your reactions. So a, uh, I'm not that comfortable with a, uh, uh, you know, how much you how much you understand this uh, video lecture materials, and uh, so in which part you have a uh, trouble with. So. There are several difficulties, but a, uh, uh, my objective is to finish this general equilibrium until the, until the end of April. So uh, in a month, uh, we are going to finish this classic theory, uh, a little bit tedious, but a uh, very important theory, because that is a uh, classic foundation on uh, microeconomics. But so I will finish this classic theory until the end of April. And we move on to a, uh, some modern theory, all right? Um, so I'm, once again, I'm sorry for late, late unloading, but I, uh, I will do my best finishing this topic. So I'll cover all the materials uh, I specified in the syllabus uh, as planned. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think I can do that, all right? So, uh, so yeah, let me, let me take the video. Um, so in this video, in this first video, I'm going to cover the uh, second welfare theorem, uh, which I couldn't cover in the, in the last week, right? So I think in the last video, I covered all the materials about the uh, first welfare theorem. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Wallachian equilibrium is part efficient, okay? Now we are going to study the converse of the first welfare theorem. So. Any price efficient allocation can be achieved as a price equilibrium with transfers in a market. Mm. So here we encounter another notion, equilibrium notion, price equilibrium with transfers. Okay? And its definition appears on page number, uh, so slide page number 25. Okay, so that is related to second welfare theorem because second welfare theorem links the idea of uh, price efficiency to supportability by means of take, uh, price taking behavior. So, uh, in other words, because we now examine whether um, you know some price efficient allocation can be supported by supported as an equilibrium in market. So we maintain assumption of price taking behavior and a market competitiveness. So every good has its own price. So in the absence of negative externalities, right? And what is, what is a price or market equilibrium with the transfers? And that allows for a uh, monetary transfer between uh, agents, okay? Between consumers, uh, between economic agents. So here is the uh, formal definition. Uh, allocations, X star. Uh, so the uh, allocation of goods across consumers and Y star, uh, you know, production plans for firms, and the price factor P star, okay, because there are algos, uh, and we assume market completeness, so we have to attach a uh, uh, some its own price to each good, okay. So price of a good one, so from the price of a good one to uh, price of a good L. So these two components constitute a price equilibrium with the transfers. If there is an assignment of wealth levels, so there is a, some redistribution of wealth levels uh, for, you know, the wealth for consumer one 
and consumer two and to consumer I. Okay, but uh, there is a one condition about this redistribution because uh, there is a no extra money right outside of this economy. So the sum of wealth across consumers. So we have a uh, sum of wealth on the left side of this equation, this condition. And this sum should be equal to, because now price factor is given by P star. So P star dot omega bar, that is a market value of the initial endowment. Okay, let me write down here. So that is a market value. Total initial endowment. Uh, total, total initial endowment. Okay. And there is some production because we, so now we consider uh, economy with production, right? So the, uh, uh, each firm produces output, right? And its value, its market value is going to be P star dot YJ star. Mm -hmm. That is nothing but the uh, firm J's profit. Right? And we add, we sum up all profits uh, for all firms. Okay. So that is a total uh, profit. Right. So, so there is some a value created by production, right? And these two will be a, a total value of this economy. So total wealth should be equal to total value, uh, you know, existing in this economy. And that is a condition for the wealth redistribution. Anyway, so the uh, wealth redistributed, you know, this way uh, for consumer one, as much as W1 super one, and for consumer I, as much as W super I. Okay. And then this is, this should be an equilibrium and price equilibrium. So that highlights the price be, uh, price taking behavior in market. Okay, so we maintain the assumption price taking behavior and we maintain assumption of market completeness. Uh, so with this assumption, uh, what so the, uh, this equilibrium concept is a little bit more generalized concept than Wallachian equilibrium because in the sense that it allows for wealth redistribution, okay? So in Wallachian equilibrium, wealth is fixed by this, okay? So once we have an initial endowment, and once we have a, some price factor, each consumer's wealth is fixed by this uh, expression, this quantity, right? But there is a, a no other restrictions on wealth here, except a, a total wealth is equal to total value. Uh, so total value uh, created by this economy. So initial endowment and the production, new production. Okay. And we have the three conditions. So that's the same as a, uh, so those three conditions are the same as, you know, the equilibrium conditions, you know, defined in, so the laid in the uh, uh, Wallachian equilibrium. So each firm, so each firm's production plan has to maximize uh, the firm's profit. Okay, so going back to the uh, uh, Wallachian equilibrium definition, so YJ star and the dot product with a, 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 a price factor should be higher than, uh, so this production plan uh, should yield, uh, should, should yield the highest profit to the firm J. Okay, so profit maximization condition. And the second, uh, the allocation to consumer I should maximize consumer I's utility given the basic constraint. Okay, now the basic constraint, the basic constraint in the Wallachian equilibrium was this. Uh, so budget set, so the basic constraint is right here. Okay, so total expenditure cannot exceed consumer's wealth but wealth is fixed by this in Wallachian equilibrium. But now we allow for wealth, uh, wealth redistribution. So now budget set takes a, a more general form, which is the so consumer I's budget set given P star and uh, given wealth level WI. Okay. 
W i is a set of bundles in his consumption set such that p star dot x i is lower than his wealth, right? Because there is no restrictions on wealth except this condition, right? Aggregate wealth is equal to aggregate you know value. Uh, of resources uh, in the economy, right? So we have this basic constraint, and within this basic constraint, uh, the allocation uh, for consumer I should maximize consumer I's utility. So we have this condition as well, and the oil market clears at the equilibrium price. So we have the same condition uh, as this market clearing condition in Wallachian equilibrium. Okay, so the only difference, uh, so the uh, only difference between Wallachian equilibrium and price equilibrium with the transfers, uh, there is a no restrictions on you know distribution of wealth in this price equilibrium. Okay. All right. So allowing for some you know wealth transfer between consumers. Now we establish uh, the second welfare theorem. So we're going to prove the uh, so we're going to prove the second welfare theorem, but in a pure exchange economy. All right. So Musgrave and Stone Green provides a exhaustive treatment on this theorem. So it provides a very general theorem in a very general uh, environment. So in the basic model I introduced in the previous video, uh, that is called a, uh, a private ownership economy. So the basic component is right here, okay? But uh, we, are going to, we are going to prove the second Merkel theorem in a pure exchange model. So we do not consider production, okay? So there is a no production, meaning that there is a no share in firms. So with these three elements, consumption sets and the consumer's preference relations and initial endowment. So with these uh, three components, uh, we are going to prove the second Merkel theorem, all right? to make our life easier, all right? So here is a statement. Uh, in exchange economy, once again, there are only three components. Uh, we abstract away production. Uh, and in which, in this economy, uh, each consumer's preference relation is locally non-satiated. Uh, so we needed this condition. Uh, so we needed this assumption. Uh, Remember that assumption was uh, necessary in the first welfare theorem. Okay, so that is a, a quite uh, weak assumption, not a, a strong assumption. And the strong assumption appears in the next. So now we assume consumers' preference is strictly convex. Right? We need this convexity. So which means if consumer I prefers bundle A to X and B to X, and the all combination, so all weighted bundle between A and B. So now the uh, uh, consumer I put weight lambda on bundle A and one minus lambda, weight one minus lambda on bundle B. So it can be thought of as a uh, uh, weighted bundle or average bundle between A and B is strictly preferred to you know, bundle X. Okay. So you know, whenever relation is strictly convex, then indifference curve is a, a very standard shape like this. So indifference curve looks like this. Then, you know, uh, if these two bundles, uh, bundles A and bundles B and bundle X, bundle A, bundle B, okay? So A is indifferent to X and B is indifferent to X, Although these three bundles are indifferent to each other, average bundle, so that is captured by the line segment between A and B, that is above the indifference curve, meaning that consumer I, so if this is a consumer I's indifference curve, oh, indifference curve, then consumer I strictly prefers that average bundle to bundle X. Okay, so we needed this strictly, strictly convexity 
on preference preference relation. Then what we have? Oh, uh, we have for every price division the location x star, there exists a price vector p star such that this allocation, because uh, we do not consider production right now, uh, we consider pure exchange model, so there is a no y star uh, production plans. Okay, so the allocation is simply determined by consumer's allocation. So the allocation of goods uh, across consumers x star. So this allocation and price vector p star uh, is can be supported as a price equilibrium with the transfers. Okay, so roughly speaking, the second welfare theorem is the converse of the first welfare theorem. Uh, if we do have so, if we have some price efficient allocation, then we may wonder that can be supported as a price taking behavior. Okay, and price equilibrium is a generalization of Wallagian equilibrium, highlighting the price taking behavior. So do not consider a wealth distribution, right? So the uh, uh, the answer is yes. So can be supported as long as uh, we have local non satiation and strict strict convexity. All right. So once again, uh, in contrast with the first welfare theorem, the second welfare theorem uh, is a little bit demanding in the sense that it requires additional assumption convexity. So here is a one counter example. If we do not have a convexity or some allocation that is price efficient, but it cannot be supported as a price taking behavior. So it cannot be supported at, uh, in, 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 in market mechanism. So here is one example, X prime, that is a price efficient because at this allocation, at this allocation, we cannot make one agent strictly better off without making the other agent worse off. The reason is, you know, this is a consumer two's indifference curve, or this is a consumer two's, uh, two's a origin, and this is consumer one's origin. And here we have a consumer one's indifference curve, right? They do not intersect. So two indifference curves do not make uh, such a lens, you know, if they intersect and make a lens like this, uh, like this, then, you know, this allocation, say X prime, is not part efficient. We can say that, right? Because uh, some feasible allocation inside the lens uh, some from by moving, so by reallocating resources, uh, from x prime to you know this point, then we can make both agents you know be strictly better off. But in this example, there is a no intersection. You know these two, uh, these two indifference curves uh, do not intersect with each other, so you know may, do not make any lens. So uh, x prime is efficient, right? But uh, in order to support this x prime as a price equilibrium, then the supporting price should be this vector, this line segment, right? But if we ask at this price vector, each consumer is maximizing their utility, the answer is no, okay? By the way, the initial endowment was right here, okay? So the uh, with this price vector, without wealth redistribution, then the uh, uh, budget line for consumer one uh, should be this dotted line, right? But in order to support this X prime as an equilibrium, so we can anticipate there is a, some monetary transfer between these two consumers. More specifically, some money should be transferred from consumer two to consumer one. Because they uh, compare with this dotted line, now the budget line uh, for consumer one shifts up, right? So that means some money transferred, some money is transferred from consumer two to consumer one. Hmm. So this is a price vector, you know, the only candidate price vector supporting this as an equilibrium, but uh, 
If you ask a consumer one is indeed maximizing his utility by choosing X prime at this price factor, the answer is no, because consumer one could be better off by choosing, say, this one. Uh, so let me read a, uh, so let me, let me delete a other, uh, so other scratch right here. So we did this, at this price factor, consumer one is not maximizing his utility because a, uh, by choosing this bundle, consumer one will be better off, strictly better off. Right. So, if a consumer, if some consumer's uh, indifference curve is not convex toward the origin, so it looks like this. So it has a some non-convex region. Right? Then the uh, uh, not every parity efficient allocation can be supported as a market equilibrium. So we need this convexity. If we incorporate production into the model, so there is some production in the model, then we need a convex production set YJ uh, uh, for the uh, so for the second welfare theorem to hold to be valid. Okay. And remember that convexity was not essential, so that was not an uh, you know necessary assumption for the first welfare theorem. Uh, so first welfare theorem is still valid. Uh, without that convexity assumption, but we need a, um, a little bit stronger assumption for the validity of the second welfare theorem. Right. Now we are going to prove this. So the this proof is way shorter than the proof in Musgrave and Winston Green because uh, we consider we consider a uh, pure exchange model, not the uh, private ownership like a general equilibrium model. Uh, also, the proof is based on the one more theorem. So, existence of orogenic equilibrium. Right? Uh, we are gonna we are gonna prove this uh, in the next chapter. So, probably the last video of this week. Uh, we establish a, uh, so we establish the fact that orogenic equilibrium exists does exist uh, in very general model. Okay. So let's take. Let's take this as a fact. Uh, equilibrium always exists in pure exchange e economies. And if we prove this statement, uh, if we prove the second welfare theorem, so first, the first step is we choose one part of uh, efficient allocation. So X star is a sum allocation central authority uh, wants to achieve, okay? Part of efficient allocation. And by definition of product efficiency, it should be feasible, okay? So in two by two exchange model, so the uh, economy can be described by uh, attribute box, product efficient allocation must be inside the box, okay? Cannot be outside of the box. So feasible, meaning that uh, for each K, so for each commodity K, Uh, aggregate demand for that good, that commodity. So X K I star, that is a consumer I's demand allocation of commodity K. So the allocation of commodity K allocated to consumer I at this price efficient allocation. So in other words, that is a, uh, so, oh uh, yeah. The, Allocation, okay. So allocation of commodity uh, K assigned it to consumer I at this priority efficient allocation. And we we sum we add all together across a consumer I. That means this is a aggregate allocation of commodity K to consumers. And should be equal to so this quantity should be equal to aggregate. Uh, initial endowment of commodity K, omega K, right? That is a feasibility. So we know this. And second, uh, so now we consider exchange economy with the, uh, you know, the, so we do not change uh, the two elements, consumers a consumption set and consumers preference relation. 
So with these two elements the same, now we change the initial location from omega to parity efficient location. All right, so now we consider new exchange economy with a new initial endowment. So initial endowment is now given by the efficient allocation. And let X bar P star denote the Wallachian equilibrium of this new economy. All right, then here I used the, uh, that result existence of Wallachian equilibrium. So you may wonder, uh, at this, so in this new economy, does equilibrium exist? But the uh, uh, it does exist. All right. So x bar is a equilibrium allocation in this new economy, and p star equilibrium price factor in this economy. All right. And these two elements, these two components, always exist. Okay? Let's take let's take this as a fact. And for each consumer i. So now we redistribute the wealth, okay? So how, I mean, the consumer I's wealth is given by, at this equilibrium price factor, consumer I now can choose uh, the allocation, the parity efficient allocation uh, assigned to consumer I. So without this monetary transfer, this XI star may not be achievable, you know, in the previous figure. With this initial allocation and with the, at this price factor, right? At this price factor, uh, for consumer one, X prime is not achievable, it's not affordable, right? It is outside his budget set, right? So we adjust the uh, uh, consumer's wealth so as to, you know, so uh, such that uh, such that, you know, the uh, parity efficient allocation is now affordable for every consumer. All right? And is it possible? You may wonder if that is possible. You know, if that was possible, then the aggregate wealth should be equal to aggregate value of this economy. Right? The, going back to the uh, definition of a price equilibrium, you know, or the aggregate wealth should be equal to this, right? But there is a no production in this pure exchange economy, right? So learning out this term, you know, for, you know, for that wealth redistribution to be feasible, I mean, to be possible, so every consumer can afford that part efficient allocation bundle then the sum of wealth should be equal to market value of the total endowment, right? But if we examine this, so going back to the proof, uh, now, so if we sum, the, sum up this wealth for all consumers, then what do we get? P star dot XI star, right? But P star is independent of our, our consumer's index. So we can put this summation notation here. P star dot sum of XI star, where I goes from one to capital I, right? And this is a aggregate, uh, aggregate initial value, uh, in endowment. So P star, of omega bar, okay? Because uh, by definition of parity efficiency, allocation is feasible. So if we sum up all allocation across consumers and we get the uh, total endowment. Okay. So this wealth redistribution, uh, so each consumer can afford parity efficient bundle is possible, okay? Is possible. All right, now what we have to show. So we found some candidate for, you know, a candidate of price vector supporting that part efficient allocation as an equilibrium. Now the thing is, this X bar is in fact equal to part efficient allocation. Then, you know, X star, P star 
becomes a volatile equilibrium. So price equilibrium of this new economy. So uh, we prove the statement. We prove the second welfare theorem. And then how they show this? Uh, so remember, X bar was defined as a volatile equilibrium uh, in this new economy, meaning that at this bundle, at this allocation X bar, each consumer you know, had to maximize their own utility. So the allocation, so now that is a demand, right? Demand, so demand schedule for consumer I at this demand schedule, consumer I's utility, so I, I, I forgot the superscript uh, I here. So consumer I's utility should be maximized, right? And the uh, because XI star was a affordable because the consumer I's wealth is as much as this, meaning that at price vector P star, XI star was a feasible, right? That was in the budget set. But instead, the consumer I chose X bar instead of XI star. So that means uh, at XI bar, consumer I's utility is higher than at XI star, right? So in other words, consumer I weakly prefer X bar to X star, okay? Uh, according to consumer I's preference relation. Okay, and this holds for every I, for every consumer. Because a, uh, uh, in Wallachian equilibrium, every consumer is trying to maximize their own utility, right? So the uh, consumer chooses the uh, one bundle, maximizes his own utility. So this relation holds for every consumer I. Okay, so that is a weak preference. Now suppose that if this relation holds strictly for some consumer I, then we have a contradiction. Which contradiction? Because we assume our X star was parity efficient, right? Parity efficient, parity efficient allocation means there is a no other feasible bundle some consumers are strictly better off without making you know, the other consumers worse off. But if this was a strict preference, then there is a way to improve consumer eyes uh, welfare without hurting the other. So that means this preference relation uh, reduced, reducing to indifference relation. So in fact, you know, is this weak preference is become to indifference relation. like this. Once again, uh, this might be a little bit confusing. So we have this relation. X bar should be weakly preferred to X star for every consumer I, because X bar is a what consumer I chose for his own interest at the uh, Wallachian equilibrium, right? But if this relation holds for some consumer I with a, a stricter preference, strict preference, okay? And for the other consumer, it's still weak preference, then that contradicts with the fact that all oh, this X star is a parity efficient allocation. Now there is another feasible allocation X bar. Consumer I is now strictly better off, and the other consumers are now just they are indifferent, right? So, because X star is a part efficient allocation, the preference relations above should, should hold with an indifference relation, namely, X bar I and X I star is a indifferent. So, yield the same level of utility. Okay? So, it does not necessarily mean X I bar is equal to X I star, right? It just means two different bundles yield the same utility, right? But now here is the law of uh, strict convexity. Now this assumption kicks in and gives us a, a contradiction. 
So what kind of a contradiction? Now these two bundles are indifferent, right? And think about their average bundle. So lambda x bar plus one minus lambda x star. Now the by strict convexity, this bundle, this bundle is feasible, right? Because we know if x bar was a, uh, a optimal bundle for consumer i, and that x i star was a feasible, then this is feasible and this is feasible, and then body constraint is a linear structure, so the average bundle is still feasible, right? I mean, in two good case, this is well visible uh, in the picture, right? Because body constraint, body line is a uh, line segment. Uh, this bundle is feasible and this is feasible, then all average bundle is feasible because that is a just overlapped with the version line. So now this average bundle is feasible and strictly preferred to, you know, the, you know, one of these two bundles, you know, either bundle, right? So that means this bundle is strictly preferred to X bar or X star. So that means all other, for all other bundles, compared to, you know, other bundles in the budget set, this is the best bundle, right? That is a contradiction, right? Because a consumer I chose X bar for himself, but there was in fact another bundle uh, that is higher utility to consumer I, right? So this is a contradiction. So consequently, the X star X I X bar should be equal to each other, right? So each consumer maximizes it really at the price efficient allocation at the given price factor P star and the given uh, consumer I's wealth. So that completes the proof. Okay. So one thing you have to notice is uh, what is the law of convexity in the proof? Okay. So convexity is necessary for you know showing that these two bundles are in fact identical. So at this price factor, we found the allocation, equilibrium allocation, and this equilibrium allocation is in fact uh, the bundle or the allocation uh, the government or central authority wants to achieve. So now let me finish this video with some remarks on the second Merkel theorem. Uh, once again, the, we have the same assumptions uh, what we made for the first welfare theorem, market completeness and price taking behaviors. So that means, especially price, if we focus on price taking behaviors, so if some agents are not of negligible size, so some agents have a market power to control the price, then the uh, uh, some price efficient allocation now can no longer be achieved by market mechanism. So in order to achieve such a uh, such a allocation. Central authority now has to intervene in a market system. So the determination of prices so infers one price factor P star. And the uh, we so for the to establish second welfare theorem, uh, we in fact need many many assumptions. So a central authority must be informed of several characteristics about individuals not just a, uh, their uh, exact preference relations, now central authority has to be informed about their initial endowment because the wealth has to be readjusted by, so the wealth has to, has to be readjusted by, you know, uh, this omega k. So, you know, in order to compute this uh, wi, we have to know each consumer is their initial endowment for the first welfare theorem, we don't have to know the initial endowment, right? Just uh, let the market work, then the uh, market uh, gives us a price efficient allocation. But now, in order to achieve price efficient allocation with a market mechanism, central authority has to know the exact initial endowment to each consumer, right? So there's uh, too much information uh, required. Uh, for the validity of central uh, second welfare theorem. Furthermore, you know, to achieve a uh, to achieve a wealth redistribution, uh, 
for the achievement of desired allocation. The money transfer should be lump sum fashion, right? It does not, it, 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 it shouldn't distort the price, price system. So the, it shouldn't distort the, uh, uh, the determination. Also, it should not intervene in the determination of prices. It, the money transfer should be a lump sum fashion, right? So the, uh, in other words, uh, this a uh, budget line should shift up or shift down without any change in the slope, right? Okay. But the, uh, in practice, any so most redistribution schemes are distortionary. So it it brings us some distortion in prices, or it brings us some loss in efficiency. Right? Think about it as some you know income tax. You know, if I if my income if 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 my income is taken away for other you know people, my half income so my half of income is taken by government. Uh, in the name of a tax, then I may not have much incentive to work as much as you know I do now. So such a redistribution scheme uh, brings about some loss in efficiency. So as a result, uh, you know such a redistribution schemes features some trade-off between uh, distribution and efficiency. That is the most important uh, trade-off for you know, uh, implementation of policies uh, when implementing some policy. So how do you interpret the second welfare theorem? I mean, you know, the second welfare theorem can be thought of as a, a positive result. So any price efficient allocation can be achieved by market mechanism. So we don't have to think about it as some other mechanism for price efficiency. That can be thought of as a, some positive result, but at the same time can be interpreted as a, a negative result. Because it requires too much information for you know central authority to achieve a uh, uh, that desired allocation, right? So the theorem just provides a useful theoretical reference point. I mean, theoretically, uh, market so that uh, any price efficient allocation can be achieved by market mechanism. Uh, but you know, uh, it is far from a direct pres prescription for policy practice. So that means, so the second welfare theorem does not, you know, does not mean at all that uh, policymakers do not have to do anything for, you know, efficiency at least, because uh, you know, it requires too much information, and then it, it asks for a uh, lump sum monetary transfer for redistribution of wealth. Okay. All right, so this is what I prepared for the second welfare theorem, and from the next video, uh, I'm going to talk about, so uh, we are going to study new topics with the new lecture slides. Hope you guys enjoy this video, and I will see you in the next one.